All right, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. What is up? I am your host, Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching another epic episode of The Charlie Shrem Show, powered by Waxman, where together, twice a week, you and I get to dive deep with some of Bitcoin and crypto's most influential leaders, Web3, tech, AI, and everything in between to truly understand how the culmination of everything that we're doing is kind of coming together and what our futures are all going to look like. We've been like writing living history together for the past four years. And um, I've been in the in the Bitcoin space, in the crypto space here for like, shit, my whole adult life for like 13 years or so. And today, and the cool thing about this show is that going back to living history is that we're, we're literally living the things that the textbooks are going to be uh, writing about. And I was just discussing that with my guest and um, I'm going to introduce him and in, um, introduce him on the show. Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Yeah, happy to be on. Thanks, Charlie. Um, we have a, you're a very special guest joining us. You're the uh, CEO of Umami Labs, uh, which is in the midst of a highly publicized conflict between you and the former employees. Um, and Umami Labs has been kind of a, a, a perfect example of the challenges that can arise when decentralized autonomous organizations as DAOs, and we just covered DAOs again on, on a previous episode, they face disagreements and disputes. Today's conversation, we're mm -hmm. going to dive into the details of his real real life story, exploring what happens when a DAO's mm -hmm. decentralized ethos clashes with the need for organization and mm -hmm. the need for resolution during times of conflict. Um, Umami Labs is an institutional DeFi firm, which is set to launch uh, it's new decentralized finance product aiming to pioneer institutional DeFi with regulatory compliance, non-custodial DeFi strategies. However, last month, this, this, the company found itself embroiled in an internal battle as almost all the employees quit, accusing the CEO, Alex, of attempting to, to do some crazy things. Uh, there was a lot of accusations flying back and forth. And as the parties involved are, are trying very hard to avoid a high profile you know, dispute, the situation has left umami token holders caught in the middle and watching the token price go up and down fall and then recover again following this drama in real time but we're really excited because um today we're going to hear from alex himself offering insights into the situation the broader implications of the world of decentralized finance and DAOs. but we're not going to focus on like the drama all the time let's go back let's go back Give us a brief, let's imagine we were having you on the show today. None of this drama happened. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Tell us about Umami. What's the vision behind the project? What problems did you see in our space and how did you want to solve them? Great. Um, well, thank you for uh, for the intro, Charlie. And yeah, so let me, let's, I will pretend that, you know, none of this has, <laughs> has unfolded for a second. It feels nice, right? So, um, you know, in, in that imaginary world where, you know, we're just excited about our product launch and having a normal, um, you know, pre-launch conversation, I would say that, you know, the vision behind Umami, you know, as, as you hit on accurately, you know, was to, you know, as we put it, pioneer institutional DeFi, right? And what, what we mean by that is that, you know, as you, as you know, well, the, the DeFi ecosystem thus far has been, you know, really focused on this relatively small and insular group of what you'd call crypto native or DeFi native retail investors, you know, a little bit of, you know, DeFi native funds. And there's a need to break break out beyond that. I mean, if this if this entire space is going to have any impact, right? Yeah. It needs to get outside of a small group of DGENs on crypto Twitter and actually impact the broader financial system, right? So the first step there is, you know, just to, you know, go to you know, currently the natural intermediary in the financial system that, you know, handles you know, the vast bulk of, you know, of assets, which would be, you know, financial institutions. And it's not like we expected to be, you know, plugging into, you know, the Goldman Sachs of the world right away. But, you know, we were very interested in, you know, creating a professionalized organization, front loading regulatory compliance, really, pro you know, thinking proactively about, you know, how can we you know, structure our products and our regulatory strategy in a way that we can deliver this to financial institutions. Sure. And, you know, from there, um, you know, hopefully, you know, having a meaningful impact on the space. I mean, that that sounds like what we all want to do, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's look at all the problems that we've had and build out some DeFi application for the future. Because if we look at especially where everything fell in the last, you know, going back last May, which I consider is like the top of the market, if you will. 
when everything's before everything started collapsing, the two winners out of everything was was actually decentralized DeFi, like real DeFi, not mm -hmm. CeFi, and and probably blockchain gaming. Um, and then everything else kind of, and even those it was still risky and everything like that so there's there's definitely a lot a lot there that you were trying to do how how do you though like was the vision early on to have a dao and then have some sort of legal structure on the other side and then have a relationship between the two because that's where the major problems yeah. are so so that's a great question and i think you know before we go any further and you know this might be something you know where where you have some thoughts as well and i'd love to hear them but you know i think at the outset i i'm going to posit something that i think is important to everything you know we're going to discuss from here which is that you know right the acronym dao is extremely you know widely used but people sort of forget that it means decentralized autonomous organization right um, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, there is a broad ethos of decentralization in DeFi. And I think a lot of protocols identify themselves as DAOs in order to illustrate that they are sort of on board with this ethos, if you will. But very few DeFi protocols are truly decentralized and autonomous, particularly when you're talking about the organizational, you know, at the organizational level, whatever core team is involved in actually laying down the tracks. So, you know, when you ask about sort of what the you know, what the intent was and what the reality was with umami um you know at the time that i took over and i didn't you know i did not develop the initial protocol code or bootstrap the treasury i came in shortly after that to give it some strategic direction at umami when i took over there was really no formal DAO governance uh structure in place there had been a few snapshot votes held at the discretion of the multi-sig all real control over the administration of the protocol and you know the allocation of the treasury was um distributed among Five or six people who, if you're familiar with you know what a multi-sig wallet is, had the ability to sort of tee up and sign off on um, you sure. know different transactions with the small multi-sig. So that was all that was in place when I took over. Um, there was no legal entity structure, no formal DAO governance structure. The goal, you know, was twofold, right? I think part of it from the start, and we were always clear about this, you know, was to you know work with you know, to, to sort of embrace reality for what it is, which is that we were going to have to have a centralized team and a centralized organization in order to build anything and launch it. Um, but, you know, at the same time, to take advantage of what on-chain governance offers to build, you know, meaningful, you know, protections and rights for token holders that yeah. would become increasingly trustless over time. So that was the vision. Um, <clears throat> we did have a LLC called Umami Labs. So I think when you introduced me, you mentioned I'm CEO of Umami Labs. That's the operating company that had hired the team members. And then there's a DAO foundation uh, that would represent, you know, the token holders, the community and the treasury. So if you will, you'd have like this for the, you know, you'd have this uh, uh, treasury DAO and all token holders and proof of stake can vote on how on proposals. And you said snapshot, snapshot.org mm -hmm. is where a lot of the proposals are you know, you can vote with your tokens on on these proposals. They they would hire uh, and pay Umami Labs to 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 manage the 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 software side of things and the and the legal and the tech side of things. And that's kind of standard. But I, I want to comment, and that's what I mean by standard is that's kind of how all DAOs are run now. You have like the labs version, and then you have the DAO, and this is kind of what's seen as the structure lately uh, in the last year or so. But what's what what what's really interesting to me is that you had this this huge DAO here uh and communication is also very decentralized it's not just in one place it's all in different places at one time so explain what you mean by that like what what is your question for me in that context? well i just no i'm just commenting on it. it's very interesting that you have there's no investor relation situation here there's no you're you're really trailblazing there's no i'm just trying to make it a point yeah. that there's no real life structures or framework that you can follow communications going on you know yeah. all over that's a place. great question uh that, that's a great point i mean there's no blueprint to follow right um but you know to be frank and this is this is something that i think you know as we talk more today, you know, will reveal itself to maybe be central to sort of the ideological elements of, you know, the conflict uh, that emerged at Umami. But, you know, there, there was no playbook in the context of, oh, this is how a DeFi DAO approaches this situation. Yeah. Um, but there still is a playbook in reality, right, for, 
you know, the, the notion of, you know, having some kind of, you know, investor base of, you know, creating a product, launching that product and so forth that exists with virtually every other startup. And I think that, you know, what was evident from the start of Umami, right, was that, you know, it, there was not, as I mentioned, you know, some sort of uh, functioning DAO. There was just a, you know, group of people who held tokens. And then there were five people on this multi-sig, the original, you know, anonymous developers of this protocol um, who effectively, you know, completely controlled it. And, you know, what needed to happen to get to the point where there could be a coherent, you know, on-chain governance structure, um, you know, and everything else you might want with a DAO, there needed to be a centralized organization that laid down those tracks. And I think that that's something that's often overlooked with, with DAOs. There's this notion that, you know, they are in fact operating autonomously, yeah. but even if there are snapshot votes, it's usually a small core team, right? That is drafting yeah. those, proposing them and so forth. So, um, you know, I, I think that, the truth is, and this is, I think, an important thing for the entire ecosystem to sort of uh, reconcile with, is that the vast majority of so-called DAOs really are not that materially different from, say, a fintech startup in terms of how they actually operate in practice. Um, and that, that was Yeah, certainly... you have to have business ethics at the same time, too. It's like a mm -hmm. course that hopefully you learned and we all learned in school. And what yeah. the point that you're trying to make and the complimentary point that I'm adding on to your point is that yeah. there's no person in the world who's probably talked to more representatives of DAOs, voters, token holders, uh, different labs like yourself. Mm -hmm. And so the overarching theme that I always have, and the listeners are nodding their head, is that there's this thing called a path to decentralization. Mm -hmm. Nothing other than Bitcoin was decentralized from the start. Right. And even that took a while. People don't realize. The only difference is that it wasn't worth anything and there was no one really around and we weren't rushing. So we can mm -hmm. work at our kinks over many years without anyone looking at us. But for everyone else, there's this path to decentralization or path to immutability. And the DAO is more of like a symbolic badge, if you will, of like saying, hey, we're on this path. Yes. Now, I've spoken to middle of the road DAOs like yourself. We've spoken to the chief of business development at Consensus, who sits on the board of like six different highly run, better run DAOs than probably some regional banks. And then we've spoken to like the head of the Ukraine DAO, who they don't even have a computer. They're not even using <laughs> technology. This is more of a symbolic, hey, mm -hmm. we're a decentralized autonomous organization trying to do charitable co cause for, you know, for, for Ukraine right now. And so, yes, it's all over the place. So where do you find the standards? Like where, where do you start? What, I mean, that's the problem. Right. And that's a great question, right? And that's, I think, where, you know, going back to what I was talking about with institutional DeFi and some of the points I was making about kind of the fundamental similarity between what, you know, self-identified DAOs do and what traditional startups do. I think that's, that question you asked is where those core concepts come into play, right? So when I, I think the reality is, you know, to your point that, at the outset, when you are creating a DAO, you have a small team of individuals who are building something new and who are doing it, you know, fundamentally, you know, as, as a core team collaborating among themselves. And over time, it might decentralize, but it doesn't start that way. I think the business ethic should be those, you know, of a traditional startup. I think that, you know, as much as, as, much as the current regulatory environment could be frustrating for, you know, everyone, in the DeFi space, I think there is something to say, you know, for some of the arguments that we've been hearing from kind of the other side of that debate, um, saying that, look, you know, these are really not that different from, you know, other entities and need to be regulated accordingly. So I, I think my my suggestion is that, you know, the, the what you are referring to, that sort of concept of progressive decentralization, you know, that there are interesting downstream discussions to have about what that looks like and how that differentiates itself from say traditional shareholder governance for example um but in terms of that initial period which could be six months a year two years of laying down the tracks i think that you know using whatever blueprint you know any other startup would use is a pretty safe bet because of the similarities so all these things that 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 are basically non-standardized and broken and non-compliant yep. within DAOs and web3 and crypto everything from treasury management, community management, legal advisory, like you have on your website, business development, all product design, all these things that further decentralization was yeah. what you were trying to do 
with umami. This was the solution. This was the problem that you were solving. And we were trying to figure it out, right? This was this was a work in progress. Like you said, there was no blueprint. It's not like, you know, when I first took over, I, I had a, uh, you know, seven point list of, okay, we're going to do these things. And, you know, that's going to solve for all of the problems facing the DeFi space right now. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, my involvement in Umami and everything I'm doing even now is motivated by this general view that these are solvable problems. I, I really don't, I don't think that DeFi's future is, to be a completely sort of parallel and separate shadow economy, if you will, right? I think yeah. that it does have the ability to be integrated with, you know, the broader financial system. I think that's where its impact is. I think there are going to be hiccups, but it's, for me, I think that the real goal needs to be, what can we do now to, you know, become more integrated and more connected now in a compliant way, knowing that, you know, there are still, further downstream problems that need to be solved, but at least we're one step closer. And, and I think that was, you know, my philosophy uh, leading Umami and still is. As a as a crypto lover, as a Bitcoin lover, as a it's my legacy, it's in my blood, it's all I have, it's all I've ever done. I want to see projects like yours highly succeed because it's just mm -hmm. would make me die a happy person later in life. And so it, it's this is what I feel like I was born, you know, born to do. And so in a perfect world, Again, we'd be talking about how awesome this launch would be and, and all these problems that you're going to solve and allow all these different projects. I want to experiment with different uh, organizations could launch and stuff like that. But but something happened. There was a divergence yeah. of, of of opinion. Was there like where did the cracks start? And I guess before yeah. you answer that down the road, I'm hopeful that those listening to this a year, two, three years from the recording are listening to a world where Umami launched, everything was resolved and everything that happened has become a case study in what other DAOs need to do that are faced with these same type of things. Yeah, I agree. And you know, I, I think that this is a really interesting case study for the space. And that's honestly one of the reasons why I've been as intent as I have been on, you know, really committing myself at this point, right, to the to the litigation at, angle um, of it, because I think that, you know, it's important to get the facts on the table and subject it to the level of analysis that it deserves so that we yeah. can you know, draw a conclusion that can be a powerful reference for other uh, protocols. Uh, so with that said, you know, I'll kind of give you the boilerplate version of the narrative. Um, you know, let's go back in time to January 2023, right? Um, I had umami labs had committed you know very publicly to a march 9th launch for its first institutional d5 product right so that was a very exciting time also nerve-wracking and as you might imagine given the entire tilt of umami uh my you know very you know my, my very high priority was to make sure that when this launch took place that we had an appropriate compliance framework um you know a regulatory pathway for this fault to follow and that you know if there were any uh, sure. elements of Umami's overall legal structure where you have that Dow Foundation, where you have, you know, Umami Labs uh, that needed to be improved on, you know, we did that. Um, and, you know, it was basically, you know, and, and this is just sort of the reality of the situation. Uh, we had we had onboarded, uh, as you would imagine, given our strategy, a chief legal officer, Alex Golubitsky, uh, with the task of creating this, uh, you know, this overall legal structure and, you know, appropriate compliance pathways for um, any products that we launch. And by January, um, you know, frankly, I had become, you know, nervous and frustrated because we didn't have that, uh, that framework in place. The legal structure was still lacking because there had not been a development of sort of formal token holder rights, you know, the kind of linked snapshots to the legal entity. And then, you know, there was simply no strategy as of January to launch the these upcoming products that we were going to launch um so i was starting to you know definitely sort of put the pressure on and i was you know going to him with a lot of different ideas that i had come up with myself a variety right um for you know kind of spitballing saying you know can we try this can we try this can we try this in terms of you know fix, adjusting any issues with the legal structure and then preparing for for this launch um and you know unfortunately you know, in a healthy organization, we would have found a great uh, solution, right? That kind of synthesized everyone's views. Uh, but in this case, for 
whatever reason, you know, it led to a falling out. I, uh, he was, I was not feeling that he was moving us forward in terms of, you know, really being willing to, to work with me to find a solution. Um, I expressed that. I said that perhaps I should get outside counsel to help us with this. He tried to block me from bringing on outside counsel, um, which of course, you know, as you would know, an attorney shouldn't do. And that, you know, basically put me in a situation where I had to ask him to at least temporarily step back so we could, you know, do this review. At this point, it was late January and the clock was ticking. Um, from there, what happened is pretty, uh, pretty unfortunate. And, you know, it's still unpleasant to think about. But um, Alex Golubitsky went and started telling the other employees at Umami that, you know, these, this decision to onboard a complaint, um, a legal advisor for review and these different ideas I've been throwing out there about potential uh, solutions you know, for ahead of the vault launch were actually motivated by some kind of illicit desire to seize control of the treasury for my own personal gain. And the former employees evidently believed that narrative, right? And there's no truth to it, you know, and, and I, I mean, I wouldn't be, you know, moving in the direction of making this a public court case if there was something like that that I had to hide. But uh, that did stick. And, you know, what, How much what money happened? are we talking about for, for here, by the way? That's a great question, right? The treasury value at the time would have been about four and a half million dollars. And to be honest, right, like if you just think about that, like that That's, was being. Oh, I thought we're talking about like a half a billion dollars. Or no, something. <laughs> no, it was just operating runway for a lean startup, right? It was operating uh, expense runway for a lean startup to launch. Had we okay. just launched the product successfully, everyone's tokens probably would have been worth, you know, something comparable to that, their token compensation. So, like, why would I, you know, destroy the whole thing a month before a product launch to, to steal you know, that amount of money, right? Um, so, anyway, you know, this gets, uh, you know, this rumor gets spread, it sticks, and um, come February 8th, which was a very crazy day, the entire team all at once using basically, you know, the same language, uh, you know, similar emails, resigned abruptly and refused to return any of the intellectual property. So, you know, either the solidity code or, um, you know, the, the model that, you know, was used for upcoming uh, product, you know, or the IP associated with the front end, they didn't return any of that. And they refused to forfeit their um, multi-sig permissions, right? The permissions to access the treasury, which of course, you know, it's just like any other, sure. and this, this is a key point, like any other employer, right? You're given some kind of proprietary access to an account uh, in your capacity as an employee. You quit. You don't take the company's accounts did, with you. you. Give it back. Did Alex's consortium have full control of the treasury at that point? Yes, by default, right? So just for context, a multi -sig Just by making an accusation of you taking over the treasury, he yes. took over the treasury effectively i mean i wouldn't say he i would say that at this point it was but, just but you know, yeah it's a it's a it's a consortium it's a it's a group of people acting under one flag it's the same thing yeah um i would say that you know it would be himself to to some extent as the instigator and then it would be michael Ayersman, the chief technology officer as the actual kind of operational leader of the consortium who really drew people together and he had direct access to the multi-sig uh so yeah i mean as soon as as you know, these rumors uh, that you know were initiated by Alex Golubitsky managed to gain traction with uh, Michael Ayersman, CTO, uh, and flip you know a number of people who had control of the multi-sig. Uh, yes, they had you know full effective control, and Umami Labs no longer did. And of course, I requested that they you know do what their contracts obligate them to do, which is just to return you know everything that they gained access to as employees upon leaving. Uh, and they didn't. And instead, they sort of declare themselves to be Umami Dao, right? But this was not, you know, them as representatives of the Dao Foundation, right, versus me as a representative of labs. That's not the conflict. It was just them in their personal capacity, giving themselves this sort of, you know, brand identity, if you will, that leveraged this ethos of decentralization to justify going what entirely into the contractual, contractual structure. Yeah. Do they, as a group, have enough to voting power and tokens right now to to control whatever wherever the votes go? It, they have a very substantial influence. So you know what, this was all done. You know, this entire process, you know, clearly was done in sort of a seat of the pants way. They first resigned, then they absconded from the uh, 
the tre you know, from with the treasury assets and the IP. And then a few days later, they held a snapshot vote to kind of retroactively legitimize that basically saying, you know, uh, we just saved you from having the former chief executive officer take personal control of the treasury. Um, and, you know, therefore, you know, we, we were declaring ourselves Umami Dow. Do you want us to move forward with the project or not? Right. Yes or no was essentially the, the context. They got 22% of uh, tokens outstanding to vote. And, you know, they would have represented, you know, I would say based on their token holdings, their own, they controlled probably about 10%. And then there were a couple whale holders who were very close with some of those team members that okay. also- So they had, effectively had- right? They basically would have- Over 50% block of that vote was them voting. I, I would think so. No, in wait, I want to ask you a question. In an, if you had, if they had walked away and resigned, you for a very brief time would have had full control of the treasury, right? Because they would have given you all the sure. keys. In in, what was in your a, plan. So remember, I I would have had full control in the sense that yeah, like you can imagine again, they, like we're talking about four million dollars here, four and a half right. million dollars. But what was I mean, your? Yeah. And, so two points though. First is you know, and this goes back to why I think DeFi does need legal structures. I would have still been the manager of an entity that had a contract with the Dow Foundation, obligating it to act. You know, is this responsible? Uh, consultant with the Dow Foundation's interest in mind, I couldn't, you know, yeah. just say oh, I have it. Someone to run off. I would have just used that uh, that funding to hire new developers and finish what we started and keep moving forward. Right? That would be yeah. the natural thing to do. And that would have been totally. You would have been under a mandate. I felt like you were under a legal framework to continue working as a yeah. fiduciary of this company. And yes. you were under like the purview of of not just your moral business ethics, but your uh, but legal of the United States, right? Like you're, exactly. you're being under your if you had done something wrong, then the token holders could sit back and someone else, you know, would be going after you, the, the government or whatever. But here now right. in this new world, you have these former how many people, like a half a dozen people. Led by yeah, a little more about, I think about nine, nine, ten people are kind of actively involved on the other side now. So like, so there was this Dow coup, if you will, that was led yeah. by accusations and rumors. We've seen, I just want to say like this happens in like around the world, you know, we see it in like these military coups all the time, but here was yes. a tech one. It's the same thing. And I want yeah. to tell you, because I've been in this space a very long time. Um, mm -hmm. sometimes I get hired as like, uh, to help. You're not the, let me just say this. You're not the first DAO to go through something very similar. Interesting. Uh, it's just a lot of times they get through it in a very private way before mm -hmm. even a token is launched and things like that. So yeah. when you just have like LPs and GPs and investors and like before anything ever launches and stuff like that, and things end up working so themselves out mm -hmm. for the token holders. So, I mean, right. so you got like, you, you don't have your tokens anymore. Right. So if you, so right. that's the thing you've, you've kind of moved away and you have to fund a big legal thing. So I understand that, but now you don't have, like, you can't say, oh, as a large token holder, this is my voice. Your voice is well, the CEO of Mommy Labs. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that you know, the, the reality is that, you know, going back to that concept of progressive decentralization, I had made some requests for the former chief legal officer, Alex Golubitsky, to put down, you know, put in place a structure that gave express rights to token holders tied to votes, right? Like quarterly or, you know, annual general meetings and, you know, the you know, some process for, you know, proposing snapshots. But that didn't, uh, that was not in place uh, by the time things, you know, went the direction they did. Um, so, you know, the reality is that if you kind of look at that legal structure, you know, what really was sort of substantively giving rights to the token holders was a contract between the Dow Foundation and Umami Labs specifying Umami Labs obligations to the foundation. So it is in that context, right? Like my token holding ownership from a legal perspective or governance perspective doesn't actually matter. What matters is the binding obligations that are still in place between Umami Labs and the foundation for labs to deliver you know, to deliver on what was promised, to build the product, to launch the product, to do so compliantly and so forth. So that's what I'm acting on behalf of. Um, so hopefully that, that's helpful. What, so what's, what's the future here for yeah. you? What do you want to see happen for you personally? Because 
do you think that the group led by Alex, I mean, is he the CEO now? Is he? No, no, he actually, I mean, he's, he's now just sort of advising. Um, you know, I think that he, I imagine that, you know, there's some, some level of common sense dictates that, you know, if you're an attorney and you're, you know, retained by a company that it's not a good look to like, not only undermine the CEO of the company and try to push him out, but then appoint yourself CEO. So he's, He's more on the periphery. I'd say the de facto leader is uh, Michael Arisman, the the chief, the former chief technology officer. And look, I mean, I think that what we've been advocating for since the start, right? So now for going on two months is let's resolve this amicably. We can do it behind closed doors. We can do it quickly. So it's you know minimally damaging to token holders. The truth is there is nothing that has been done that can't be undone by arriving at a... True. You know, fast amicable resolution and then finish that you know legal review that I had started so we have the right compliance framework in place and then launch the vault and move forward right like that would be the ideal um, but unfortunately that's just not the direction it's been tracking do you think it's too much like sorry my air conditioning <laughs> went on again it's so stupid do you think too much like things have been said for their way for you and umami to like not talking about your legacy like what if there's a good resolution where your legacy is intact and everything is worked out and resolved but do you think that you could be a part of the future of umami or do you think that ship has sailed i would say that I, it's very difficult to imagine you know myself and the former team right the folks who were defendants in the litigation kind of getting back together and working cohesively i think that repairing you know the issue with uh, the community more broadly is still you know perfectly viable and and that i mean, think that if i did you know as i expect succeed in the litigation or if we just come up with a decent settlement um you know i think the, the act of me quickly hiring new developers and moving forward and trying to deliver value would very quickly uh heal that rift right. but look, I, I agree right that the goal here is to find whatever path is, is kind of smoothest to correcting these issues uh but you know without impacting token holders unduly what's interesting here is that like token holder rights are, mm -hmm. are are coming up as like a frequent topic of conversation where it's like you have investor rights here you have token holder rights and it's like it's different right it's like mm -hmm. a, it's like a lighter version because when you haven't when you're invest that's why the it's so hard they almost need a whole new framework, a new term mm -hmm. for like securities light, because tokens you go in and out of quickly. You don't there's there is token investor loyalty, which is a big mm -hmm. metric when I score a project is like, what is the loyalty of the token holder? Yeah. But you're thinking in your head for like the value of the token holder. So as a token holder, if I was a token holder, all I'd want to see is the products launch value created for the protocol and all this stuff behind you. So it sounds mm -hmm. like you're on that page. Is everyone else on that page yeah, too? I'm on that page. I think token holders are on that page in the sense that they want this issue to be resolved. I think that, you know, the as you might imagine, just the kind of raw fact that, you know, the former employees are in control of, you know, all of the, you know, assets and IP of the protocol has given them the larger megaphone for now with the community. But I, I think that one thing, you know, that they're in agreement with myself on is the desire to have this issue resolved and out of the way. Um, but, you know, going back to what you said about token holder rights, I, I agree. I mean, I think that what's interesting is that if you think about what blockchain is and what smart contracts are, there's clearly a possibility to take the rights that are, you know, conferred onto traditional securities holders, right? Like, you know, folks who, you know, own stock uh, and actually just, have all of that in place, but make them even stronger, right? By making yeah. it so that you know, not only are you legally entitled to a dividend, but there's a trustless mechanism for distributing, you know, operating income directly to the shareholders. And I, so I think that, you know, that that's vi that's perfectly viable. It really shouldn't be, you know, securities light, right? It should be something that's even more robust. But to your point, that short termism that you mentioned, you know, that comes from protocols being liquid way before, right? A traditional venture back startup would be liquid gets in the way, I think, of building, you know, some of those more thoughtful mechanisms out. I don't even know how you would like do it when you have token holders and shareholders, which some projects have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think that, 
you know, the direction that a lot of protocols are going to move will basically just be true tokenized equity. And I think that, you know, that's when we talk about, you know, moving in the direction of institutional DeFi and using existing regulatory pathways, you know, we're talking about kind of leveraging the protect the investor protection frameworks that, you know, various jurisdictions have created operating within them, but then baking them in on chain. And at that point, there would be no reason to have yeah. token shares. I agree that it's not good to have tokens and shares because then that's only going to work to the the detriment of the token holders. Well, the I I would love to see a world with tokenized equity happen. Yeah, we always, but it's it's very far off. We always and I, and I'll tell you why my thoughts are is that we always thought that there's a that everyone thinks that the biggest problem with tokenized equity is a the lack of regulations from like the the SEC mm -hmm. and then you have uh, MICA in Europe and some of the other ones. You don't have like a, a, a clear pathway for an institution or a project to like tokenize their equity. Now there mm -hmm. are like friend, you know, if you go to stomarket.com, there are yeah. companies like Securitize, INX that do yep. it, which leads me to my second problem, which is the real problem. The real problem is liquidity is that there's no liquidity in, in these markets. And if there's no liquidity, yep. there's not going to be a lot of demand, but the same liquidity problems that you see in these institutional platforms is the same liquidity problems you saw way back when, when most Bitcoin trading was happening on exchanges that didn't ask you for ID. Mm -hmm. And no, and everyone said, oh, if you start to require ID all from the, these, these, you know, it's such a convoluted process to like KYC yeah. someone, it takes three days that no, all the liquidity is never gonna go there. It's just gonna stay on these fringe exchanges. And it did for a while, but whatever, but what happened was, the, the companies within the, the Bitcoin ecosystem and the, the new crypto ecosystem realized that you could apply the same like money transmitter laws, kind of the same thing that I went to, to jail for. You can apply those same laws and you could make it really quick and really easy for people well, to open up an account on a crypto or Bitcoin exchange like Coinbase did and some of the other ones. So liquidity eventually went and went legal. That's why mm -hmm. most of the liquidity is on legal. Now to get to the security token platforms, the problem yep. is, is that proving accreditation, which most people don't even know that they're not right. accredited, only like 10% of the US population is accredited. But proving accreditation is not just about like self certifying, you have to upload documents and also other hub yep. levels. So that's the biggest problem, there needs to be yep. some sort of like, I don't know. Like, yeah, look, I get I get excited listening to you because you hit the nail on the head, and I, there are some things that I really want to want to share just sort of on that general topic. Um, you're you're spot on, right? That there and that it's sort of this um, sort of this almost you know chicken or egg dynamic, right? Yeah. Where you need to first have that liquidity in place in order for there to be a market for you know tokenized securities. But if there's no market right now, what's going to draw the liquidity in to support it? Um, and you know, I think that is the most foundational issue. So just just a couple points. I, I strongly yeah, agree course. that, you know, the the dynamic that you just described with, you know, Bitcoin trading moving eventually towards permission platforms is what's going to happen with DeFi. I think that DeFi is sort of, you know, the ecosystem is kind of ideologically resistant to that, but it almost doesn't matter because I, we see that, you know, regulators are cracking down hard on permissionless platforms. Um, but what's really important to watch, and, and these are just sort of, you know, early indicators of where things are going to go, is that there is, you know, now technology and products in place that I think are the beginnings of what will cause that liquidity migration into the permissioned ecosystem. So you made a great point about how cumbersome it is to prove accreditation. There are really cool um, protocols in place. For example, they're called zero knowledge identity proofs. Uh, sure. That would, you know, allow someone to go through this KYC <laughs> once, and then either they're either, you know, at that point their wallet is either contained within a smart contract controlled by the protocol, or they get some kind of NFT. But they can reuse that again and of again course. to open up any DeFi app. And I think the other thing that I'll share is that I there again I think we'll see more traction over the next eighteen months. But there, there's a huge spread right between the the risk-free rate in the money markets for fiat, for example, uh, on USD versus what you're going to get if you stick USDC in Aave, right? And so there's now you're never going to have, you know, access to the yield on treasuries if, you know, you don't have a permission product, right? That would be that would be a disaster. Um, but I, I've spent a lot of time talking to different 
uh, you know, DeFi funds to begin with. And there is a strong appetite for that. So, so in other words, I think that, you know, both the emergence of, you know, products that allow people to get significantly more attractive returns on, you know, just their stable coins by going through that, you know, permissioning process and then, you know, far superior ways to kind of, you know, have permission dApps that are not nearly as cumbersome, that that's going to move the industry probably pretty quickly towards having enough liquidity to actually support, you know, what we're talking about, some kind of, you know, tokenized securities market. Yeah, that would be, that would be the best situation possible. That passporting mm -hmm. solution that you talked about, that's mm -hmm. a problem in, in zero knowledge proofs allowing for any any verified vendor to check if you are accredited without the information having to be shared with another private market is mm -hmm. the primary problem in secondary private markets today secondary private markets other than going public you have like private equity sure right. you have the jobs act created secondary private markets you know you have you have nasdaq private market in fact barry silbert's first company you know Gen, uh, uh grayscale everyone knows the the bitcoin etf that they're all following barry silbert his first mm -hmm. company was called secondmarket.com which was a new and innovative way for these new tech startups to allow mm -hmm. their employees to trade employee shares and things like that it's mm -hmm. basically but it's still the problem is that once they have a customer and they prove their accreditation, the work has been so hard to get that customer that they mm -hmm. don't want to share it with another private market. And then yeah. that prevents liquidity from being all over the place, which would benefit everyone. So it's like this chicken and egg problem. But with zero yeah. knowledge proofs, you could have that without, it, it's basically would solve that everything I just said, you would not have to share the data, but you can ask without having to trust that other, it's a beautiful solution to the beautiful. Byzantine general's problem. But again, that mm -hmm. won't be allowed to be used until the SEC or the congressional committee that runs the SEC, whatever they're called, the House Financial Committee or whatever, whatever, allow that to happen. Because they didn't allow it to happen in private markets. Why would they allow it to happen in crypto? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the the first step and this is something that you know this uh, this to me has to happen before we can even have the conversation yeah. you're talking about and it hasn't happened yet would be you know just moving in the direction of you know getting this infrastructure in place you know for for basic permissioning uh for the xus market right and i think that you know the the near term sort of market segmentation that would make sense for the industry would be you know maybe not even accredited investors, maybe like qualified institutional buyers, right? Like the most lightly regulated, largest, you know, group of investors on one hand, and, you know, then all sorts of ex-US investors on the other. And I, I think that by, you know, that to me, focusing on those groups kind of allows, will allow protocols to sandbox some of these solutions, develop the infrastructure. And then, you know, to your point, like, I can't speak to what's going on, you know, in the SEC's head or where exactly, you know, right, US, uh, regulation of DeFi is going to go. I do operate under the assumption that you know this is an industry that you know has staying power and will become oh. increasingly important. And so the U.S. is eventually going to accommodate it. But I think sandboxing it in those less you know closely scrutinized or heavily regulated uh, market well, segments. Let start. me ask you a question. I like this qualified institutional buyer, and that was alluded to the other day in the congressional hearings. Uh, someone, one of the senators or whatever, a congresswoman or someone, they said. Uh, like, why can't you, or they were alluding to like, why do people in crypto need to be accredited if they're a qualified buyer? Like mm -hmm. if they understand crypto, if you're, if, and that's a law, it's not, we're not making this up. I just Googled it. It's a law in finance where a purchaser of securities is deemed financially sophisticated enough and legally mm -hmm. recognized by securities market regulators that need, yeah, I would say if you're in crypto, they're like, so what's that standard now? What's that bar? Who sets that standard? Like, that's a great thing. Is that what you were working it on? It is a great thing. And look, I, I, to be perfectly honest, since I do intend to get Umami back and then just sort of move in the direction of building some, uh, yeah. some really cool things in the future, I don't want to put all my cards on the table right now, okay, just in, cool. sort of, sure. in terms of how we think about some of these things. But let's put it this way. You were right that there are, there are segments of the U.S. market, you know, essentially very large institutions in most cases, that would not be subject to the same level of scrutiny, even as accredited investors. 
And then, of course, you have the entire ex-U.S. market, you know, from institutional down to retail as well, where there are pathways to uh, to market to them that are more lightly regulated. And so I think that, you know, for me, like I'm always very interested in what can be built now and launch now that lets us move in this direction that you and I are talking about. And those are both to me very interesting market segments. I think that things could be done uh, for both of them, right? That would move us more towards being the sort of industry that could plug into the larger financial sector yeah. instead of this fringe, right? Permissionless world. But in order for us to, to get there, we need to avoid these internal conflicts, yes. especially now when the rest of the world is looking at us. And this is what yeah. I try to like remind these these people is that forget the token holders. It's like I, I grew up in a very religious Jewish community, and I remember very specifically my family telling me people are not just going to judge you on you, but they're going to judge the whole Jewish people based on what you do. And in crypto, it's the same way. However, mm -hmm. you and I act is how the rest of the world is going to judge us for the next 10 years. And it's very important to have to have like the right transparent message. So like what? What I mean, what what do you have? To, I know you have probably a lot of thoughts on that specifically, but I guess yeah. my question is in the larger question is like, you know, what how would you have done something differently? Like what 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 can other DAOs do to prevent themselves from getting in the same situation? Um, that's, that's a great question. I think it kind of cuts to the core of the overall culture and orientation of DeFi right now. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I think that the DeFi ecosystem just needs to turn a leaf. I, I don't think it's as simple as, oh, if DAOs make this sort of micro level adjustment, they're going to be able to meaningfully integrate. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that I, I think that I would get my, my, my guess is that the U.S. regulatory crackdown is going to really shake out a lot of the more, you know, immature, permissionless, sort of, you know, a non-led, right, like run by anonymous people sorts yeah. of protocols in DeFi. But it's going to create an opening for for new players, which I had wanted Umami to be. And I think that those new players will speak a totally different language from the start, right? I mean, they might still talk about a goal of becoming a DAO at some point, but I think that front-loading discussion of, you know, right now we are, you know, we are... Uh, not a DAO, right? Be completely honest about that. We're a centralized organization. We're laying down the tracks and we're going to, you know, do our best to do so in a way that is compliant. And we're going to, you know, be transparent and market to, you know, the broader world, not just, an e you know, just the insular DeFi ecosystem. I think that that needs to be the narrative. And if there needs to be a bit of a shakeout first from these regulatory crackdowns to get there, um, that's okay. Because it, it at least accelerates that process. Yeah, I agree. It, I enforcement sucks but if, mm -hmm. if it's the only thing that we've been getting i don't like to see mm -hmm. friends go to jail because i've been there no. um i so I'd, I'd like to see just you know them continue to go after just like the fraud side of things which it seems like that's where the enforcement type of is although a lot of really good projects and companies fall through the cracks and get enforced too but i agree with you that's the future i mean right now if the community was listening to you and they are and even your former employees and everyone there it's like what resolution would you would you like to see going forward i mean you just want to see everyone kind of like just would you like to see everyone just start not second guessing everything that you say again i hate that yeah, I mean, of course, that would that would be nice, right? On a personal level, I think that you know the broader resolution is you know, as I as I think we were kind of indicating with this conversation that you know legal structures matter, contractual obligations matter, that you know that framework that was being built at Umami, even if it was imperfect, even if it was still a work in progress, was the future of of the entity and was what was going to allow it to go where it had been intended to go since you know very early on, um, and. I, I think that right right now the space has this really strong the DeFi space has this really strong ideological resistance to anything you know that is not entirely on chain and entirely permissionless, and I I think what I would convey yeah to the community but to the ecosystem is that I I understand that sentiment but the ecosystem is going to have to change and it's going to have to move in this you know more traditional uh, you know compliance forward direction so. Hopefully there's going to be a resolution 
that brings all the assets and IP back into that framework that's been built and then enables us to move forward and improve the framework and launch the product. And that's good for everyone. Uh, but more generally speaking, I think that those points that I made are, are what I would want to impart. Yeah, on you're, it's kind of funny because it's the same, it's the same DAOs are like families and we all grew up, they're not business organizations yet because most mm -hmm. DAOs don't generate business. So they're more, family organizations uh, organizations sh they should be like looked at as more of like organizations doing charitable causes and and maybe have some or just like an artistic community that wants to build a museum or make a film or something very yeah. unique you know but what you're talking about is this like economic family dilemma that happens where families believe that because they're family or like people that are really close in business believe that because they're very close they don't need legal paperwork and therefore and to even like say that we should do have legal paperwork is like a sign of distrust when honestly mm -hmm. i've been down that this road guys my listeners even if you lend a family member money just have a text message outlining the terms it's yep. not it, it just and this is the beauty and this is how we're going to end the show this is the beauty of of bitcoin and crypto this is what it solved it removed the ability of the need to trust centralized parties. And that doesn't need to be an institution. That could be your family member or another DAO member. It removes the need to like trust these people or these institutions because you can verify it through an on-chain capability. But in the interim, not everything can be on-chain like we were talking about. And until the point that every legal contract can be on-chain, you have to have legal agreements off chain and you have to have some path to decentralization. Now, it's my belief that it has to be transparent and people need to talk about it. That's why whenever I have a project on the show, I ask, what's your roadmap? But but yeah, I'm really happy that we are all, we're all in agreement here on this. And I, and I wish yeah, we are. I, I, I appreciate that. And I couldn't have said it better myself uh, what you just said at the end. So thanks uh, very much, Charlie, for the time. And it was a pleasure. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really hoping everything works out. It will. Um, I've seen these things play out. The best thing that you can do right now is time. Like try to give, put some space between everything that happened, yeah. because a lot of times it's just emotions. That's the only advice I can give you. Uh, it seems like everyone, the good thing here is that everyone is in the same agreement that they wanted to work out for the community. Mm -hmm. So that's the positive thing. So that I'll is true. So I hope so. Yes. Thank you very much.